we launch it. We need it. Must have the precious. They stole it from us, sneaky little habitses. Wicked, tricksy, false. No, not master. Yes, precious, false. They will cheat you, hurt you, lie. Master's my friend. You don't have any friends. Nobody likes you. Not listening, I'm not listening. You're a liar and a thief. No. Murderer. Go away. Go away. I hate you. I hate you. Where would you be without me? <clears throat> I saved us. It was me. We survived because of me. Not anymore. What did you say? Master looks after us now, so we don't need you. What? Leave now and never come back. No. Leave now and never come back. <coughs> Leave now and never come back. We told him to go away, and away he goes, precious. Gone! Smeagol is free! Well, my apologies to Andy Circus for all of that, um, and to Peter Jackson, and to J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, but now, on to chemistry. Today we're going to discuss uh, fatty acid metabolism and then cholesterol synthesis, and this will complete our unit on metabolism. Next time, we'll talk about synthetic polymers, plastics, the kind of things that uh, surround us that we encounter every day. But for today, let's focus on fatty acid metabolism. So, <clears throat> here is an example of a fat or an oil. Fats and oils are triacylglycerols. That means this three carbon unit here uh, is glycerol. There's an oxygen on each carbon, and each of those oxygens is tied up in an ester bond with a long chain fatty acid. The fatty acid is what we call this carboxylic acid group in blue. And each fatty acid tends to be uh, anywhere between 12 to 20 carbons long. Uh, some fatty acids are unsaturated, that is they have at least one double bond and the double bond is always cis. There are monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, triacylglycerols with a lot of unsaturated fatty acids are uh, oils, like vegetable oil or olive oil. Whereas triacylglycerols that have mostly saturated fatty acids, that is, no double bonds in the long hydrocarbon chain, are known as fats. Uh, triacylglycerols are an example of lipids, <clears throat> that is, molecules that are relatively nonpolar. And you encounter these triacylglycerols uh, a lot in the world around you. One of the uh, chief differences between fats and oils, oh, and I guess I should say that all of these carboxylic acids don't have to be the same thing. Uh, a chief difference between fats and oils, uh, well, is, as I said, whether or not the fatty acids are saturated or have du double bonds in them. And having uh, double bonds versus not has a dramatic influence on the physical property of the fat or oil. Fats are solids oils or liquids. For example, um, <clears throat> here are the melting points, not of the corresponding triacylglycerol, but rather um, of the fatty acid. 
12 carbon long fatty acid fully saturated melts at 43 Celsius. That's really hot. It's solid up to and in, uh, up to and past uh, body temperature, human body temperature, which is 37 Celsius. Add four more carbons. You go up by 20 degrees, two carbons after that, up by five or six, and then two carbons after that, and you're up to 77 degrees Celsius. And the reason melting point increases is you're increasing, as you increase the number of carbons in the fatty acid chain, you're increasing the surface area of the molecule and thereby increasing the strength of the van der Waals interactions, these induced dipole interactions between fatty acid molecules. Um, in contrast, the unsaturated fatty acids have much lower melting temperatures uh, relative to their fully saturated counterparts. Compare uh, the 16 carbon saturated fatty acid melting point, 63, with a 16 carbon monounsaturated fatty acid. This uh, molecule has a double bond between carbons 9 and 10, and that double bond is Z or cis, like this. Uh, that melting point is zero. Why such a huge difference? Uh, we see a similar difference when we compare the melting point of the fully saturated 18 carbon chain versus the mono and saturated 18 carbon chain. Uh, 69 degrees Celsius versus 13 degrees Celsius. So a fairly large decrease just by including that cis double bond. Why do you suppose that's the case? Well, Saturated fatty acids can pack against each other uh, quite readily uh, because of their flexible shape. Two saturated fatty acids can engage in van der Waals interactions, and they can actually have much more contact with each other because of their flexible shape. In contrast, um, Cis, uh, well, unsaturated fatty acids have these uh, cis double bonds in them that tend to kink the shape of uh, the fatty acid and make it, and that kink in the shape makes it more difficult for the cis uh, fatty acids cis double bond containing unsaturated fatty acids to, to make close contact with each other. And uh, when you're nonpolar, the shape of the molecule matters because the shape can determine how close in contact the individual molecules can be. And with this kinked shape, they can't contact each other as much as, they, as the fatty acids could uh, when they were fully saturated. Fully saturated. Um, so another interesting feature of fatty acids is as we increase the number of double bonds, the melting point begins to drop, uh, approaching some limit. So if we introduce uh, a an additional double, double bond, have a... Uh, this unsaturated fatty acid, uh, one double bond between 9 and 10, one double bond between 12 and 13, and all of them Z, the melting point drops by about 25 degrees down to minus 12 Celsius. This is a liquid past freezing point of water. Um, if you have um, three double bonds starting at carbons 9, 12, and 15 with all of them Z, you have an even lower melting point. A 20 carbon chain with four Z double bonds has a melting point of 50 below. Uh, Celsius, meaning you could be, it would still be a liquid uh, outside in Canada in the winter. Um, and uh, these, poly, these unsaturated, let's see, monounsaturated, diunsaturated, these here with multiple double bonds would be called polyunsaturated fatty acids. And uh, these acids have names and you'll occasionally uh, hear them. Oleic, linoleic, and linolenic 
uh, are, uh, fatty acids are major components of the fatty acid chains for triacylglycerols that are in vegetable and olive oils. Um, this is the structure of linolenic acid, a 18 carbon chain. Here's the double bond between carbons 9 and 10, uh, between 12 and 13, and between 15 and 16. Uh, I show you linolenic acid because it is an example of what we call an omega-3 fatty acid. We call it omega-3 uh, because it's got a double bond, three carbons from the end of the fatty acid chain. We call that end the omega carbon, uh, even if there's uh, fewer than however many Greek letters there are between the alpha carbon and the end. The end is always called the omega carbon. And omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids means you've got a double bond uh, starting at three carbons from the end. And uh, omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to be important uh, nutritionally, and, uh, and uh, linolenic acid is an example of those. Um, so... If we look at different sources of fat that you might encounter, here's lard, which is animal fat. Back when I was on the mission in McAllen, Texas, the uh, rest, or sorry, the grocery store that was most popular down there was a grocery store called HEB. Uh, we, because it was Texas and because we were both English and Spanish speaking missionaries, we compromised and we called it La HEB. And there were these large jars, actually five gallon buckets of, uh, of lard that they sold at the HEB, La HEB, and they would have written on them manteca. Why would you need five gallons of manteca is the Spanish word for lard? Um, why to make flour tortillas and tamales, of course. Uh, in any case, if you look at the composition in terms of fatty acids of triacylglycerols from animal fat, 50% um, is oleic acid, that's monounsaturated, uh, but almost the rest of it has is uh, 16 and 18 carbon um, fully saturated fatty acids. And there's a little bit of a, of a dye of linolenic, linoleic acid, which is a dye unsaturated fatty acid. Compare that with olive oil, uh, where you have only 5% uh, each of the 16 and 18 carbon uh, fully saturated fatty acids, 80% oleic acid, monounsaturated, uh, and then 7% uh, dye unsaturated. And then if you compare that to peanut oil, and, and some restaurants uh, cook their stuff in peanut oil, I believe, is it possible that Chick-fil-A and Five Guys maybe do that? So you have to watch out if you've got peanut allergies. But peanut oil is 60% of the uh, 18 monounsaturated fatty acid and 20% of the dye or polyunsaturated fatty acid with a little bit about the same amount of saturated fatty acid as is olive oil. Of course, peanut oil and olive oil are liquid. Lard is a solid. Uh, and some of you, we talked about this in my 351M class, but uh, you may have uh, learned this in, 50, in 351 as well if you didn't take it from me. If not, here we go. Um, so at the grocery store uh, where we used to be able to go often before uh, social distancing, you had many choices for peanut butter, some of which were called Skippy or Jif or other brands. Back when I was a kid, there used to be a Peter Pan brand. And the little jingle was, get your peanut butter anytime you can, only if it's Peter Pan. Um, there are lots of jingles from my childhood that I can remember, apparently, because marketing works. Um, anyway, there's a choice of Skippy and natural. Uh, if you look at the natural peanut butter, um, often at the top of the peanut butter, there is a layer of oil that's a liquid. Um, whereas if you look at Skippy, there is no such layer of oil. 
um, in many in many sort of processed peanut butters, they've actually taken those fatty acid oils, uh, the oil they've, they've they've taken the triacylglycerols, and subjected them to metal catalyzed hydrogenation, which saturates or uh, reduces the double bonds to the full alkane. That changes the fatty acid, or rather the triacylglycerol, from uh, a liquid form to a solid form that can be mixed up with the rest of the peanut butter solids and gives you this nice homogeneous mixture. If you've got, natu if you've got natural peanut butter, uh, you've got that layer of oil at the top, which is less dense than the peanut solids that are below, and you have to stir it up frequently. Um, why would people want to go with the saturated fats in, in processed peanut butter versus the unsaturated fats in natural peanut butter? Well, these double bonds are subject to oxidation. Uh, the allylic carbon actually is, is subject to radical modification with oxygen, and you get these peroxides and their other degradation products, and these make the oils smell and taste bad. They go rancid. So um, any of you who served uh, missions in hot climates and you carried around a little bottle or a container of olive oil, consecrated oil to perform blessings and and you only need a little bit and so you never ran out and when you come home from the mission and you unscrew that little cap and take a whiff it smells disgusting. That is because the oil has gone rancid and it's time to replace it. All right, there's more we could say about that. We want to get into the chemistry now. Um, let's talk about the metabolism of fats. And I've got some structures here. Of course, feel free to pause uh, the discussion if you want to copy some stuff down. The notes will be available online as well. The first step in fat metabolism, uh, fat and oil metabolism, is ester hydrolysis. So uh, we're going to take the triacylglycerol and add water, and we're going to hydrolyze each of these esters into the glycerol molecule and then three fatty acid molecules. And uh, as I think the uh, composition analysis of lard and olive oil and peanut oil shows you, those fatty acids don't all have to be identical. They can be different. The enzyme that does this is called lipase, and the mechanism is interesting. And so we'll talk about it because you'll encounter it later in biochemistry. It's the so-called catalytic triad, and, and we may have talked about this before in 352, but we'll, abbrevi uh, we'll, we'll uh, go abbreviate it here, uh, but review it again. Sorry. So the lipase enzyme has three key residues in the active site, the so-called catalytic triad, an aspartate residue, a histidine residue, and a serine residue. Here is your triacylglycerol, and we need to break this bond between the carbonyl carbon and the alcohol oxygen of glycerol. We're abbreviating this structure. Uh, the enzyme is going to use this serine residue as a nucleophile, but we need to remove the proton from the serine before it can attack the triacylglycerol directly. That's where aspartate and histidine come in. Uh, you've got lone pairs on the histidine nitrogen that could be the base, but it's, uh, if you remember pKa's of his, uh, imidazolium ions, which are about 6, versus the pKa of alcohols, which are about 16, probably not strong enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so the active site of the enzyme places this negatively charged aspartate residue very close to the histidine, and it will actually remove the proton from the other side of the histidine. That makes the uh, imidazole ring very electron rich and makes it possible now for the ring nitrogen to remove a proton uh, from the serine oxygen. So we're gonna show the lone pairs here. We could show them going on to this nitrogen, then this nitrogen becoming negatively charged, and then the, these lone pairs doing the attacking. Instead, we'll just abbreviate that and show the pi bond coming over here to form a new nitrogen-hydrogen bond. Uh, we could then show these electrons going on to serine, 
and then in a subsequent step, serine attacking the carbonyl carbon of our triacylglycerol. Instead, we'll just show these electrons from the oxygen uh, hydrogen bond breaking are coming over the bond between oxygen and hydrogen breaking and those electrons on oxygen now coming over and attacking the carbonyl carbon to give us a tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate looks like this. Notice that now, uh, after the reaction, after we get to this intermediate, our aspartate residue is neutral and protonated. Our histidine residue is neutral. Uh, and our tetrahedral intermediate is negatively charged. So we've sort of shuttled the negative charge from here all the way over to here, and we've shuttled the orange proton from histidine over to aspartate. Um, at this stage, the tetrahedral intermediate needs to collapse, and at the same time, our triacylglycerol, or rather the glycerol portion of our molecule, needs to leave. So here we go, lone pairs uh, from the oxygen kick down and kick off the negatively charged oxygen as a leaving group. As it's leaving, it will actually pick up the proton from the histidine, uh, and then histidine will regain its proton from aspartate, which will then be negatively charged. So the catalytic triad mechanism is really a proton shuttle. You're going to trade protons uh, across these three residues to make the reaction happen faster. At that stage, um, we've got what is called the acyl enzyme intermediate, where instead of having an ester with the glycerol portion of our molecule, we have an ester with the enzyme. The serine oxygen is tied up in an ester with the fatty acid. Um, and at this point, our enzyme is reset for the next step. I guess I should have pointed out that um, the thing that leaves here is the glycerol molecule. Now, we, so far, we've just shown you the hydrolysis of uh, one of those esters, and if there were other esters on this glycerol molecule, they would need to come back through this cycle again. Okay, we've attached the fatty acid to the enzyme. Now we're ready. So, so the first sort of step was uh, what we might call transesterification. So now we've still got an ester, but now we're attached to the enzyme. At this stage, we need to hydrolyze this bond between the enzyme and the uh, and fatty acid. Some of you may ask, why don't we have water act as the nucleophile from this step? Um, remember that the job of the enzyme is to accelerate the reaction, uh, and uh, presumably when the triacylglycerol binds, the serine is closer to the oxygen, I'm sorry, to the carbonyl carbon than any water molecule could be. Once the triacylglycerol leaves, there is room in the active site for water. Uh, and what happens next is uh, a, a similar set of proton shuffle events. The oxygen on aspartate removes the proton from histidine, which removes a proton from water, which attacks the carbonyl carbon, uh, generating a tetrahedral intermediate. Um, and then the tetrahedral intermediate collapses and uh, the, elect the, bond, the electrons in the bond between the carbonyl carbon and the ester oxygen, uh, that bond breaks, they move on to the oxygen. We could show that as an intermediate, but instead we'll show the uh, oxygen picking up a proton from histidine and histidine picking up a proton from aspartate and then our fatty acid is free from the enzyme and our enzyme is reset and ready to go on an additional round of catalysis. Okay, so this is how we get those fatty acids off the glycerol molecule. Now, what happens to glycerol? Well, if you've noticed, glycerol has three carbons in it and each carbon has an oxygen on it. That's not all that different from 
uh, a molecule from glycolysis. This is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, also a three carbon molecule, also with oxygens on each of those carbons. The only difference is we need a uh, phosphate on one of those oxygens and we need another one of those oxygens to be a ketone. So getting from glycerol to dihydroxyacetone phosphate is straightforward. Uh, there is a glycerol kinase that phosphorylates uh, one of the terminal oxygens of glycerol uh, using ATP uh, and ADP is the uh, Byproduct. This is an SN2-like mechanism as the oxygen gets deprotonated and then attacks the gamma phosphoryl group, as we showed you uh, in glycolysis. Then we're going to oxidize the 2-hydroxy group using NAD+, via the typical hydride delivery mechanism that you've seen before. The enzyme that does this is glycerol phosphate, unsurprisingly dehydrogenase. Uh, and we get NADH out of that process, and then dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which we can send, uh, which can uh, go be shunted right into the glycolysis pathway uh, and be metabolized further down to pyruvate and then to acetyl-CoA and then to the citric acid cycle. You have seen similar mechanisms for this kinase step and this dehydrogenase step, so I won't draw them uh, for you here. I will refer you to uh, metabolism part two lecture where we discuss those mechanisms in detail. Uh, next is fatty acid activation. Uh, the fate of the fatty acid is going to be uh, to convert it piece by piece, piece by two carbon piece into acetyl-CoA. But before we do that, we need to convert the oxygen of the fatty acid into a thioester. So this is fatty acid oxidation. Um, here is the reaction. We combine the fatty acid with ATP. Uh, and the mechanism here is somewhat unusual. Uh, rather than have the oxygen on the fatty acid attack the gamma phosphoryl group to generate a uh, Uh, a fatty acid slash phosphate mixed anhydride of the kind we saw before with 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. Uh, Instead, the oxygen attacks the alpha phosphoryl group of ATP. And then what leaves is a pyrophosphate group comprised of the gamma and beta phosphoryl groups. In other words, the pyrophosphate group leaves. Um, I suppose for completeness, I might have also showed this uh, magnesium ion. still chelating the pyrophosphate oxygens and, and making it a better leaving group. Uh, so pyrophosphate's a decent leaving group, and what you have is um, the <clears throat> fatty acid linked to adenosine monophosphate via this mixed anhydride bond of the kind we've seen before. Now, you could ask why does nature do this? Instead of just having the phosphate, why, why don't, instead of just attacking the gamma phosphoryl group to install just a single phosphate on the fatty acid, why do we attack the alpha to get the adenosine monophosphate version of the carboxylic acid? The answer is, I don't know, sorry. Um, in the next step, we're going to use the thiol of coenzyme A as the nucleophile and it's going to attack the carbonyl carbon to give you a tetrahedral intermediate. Um, likely some base needs to remove the proton on uh, coenzyme A first. Uh, that might be solvent, it might be an enzyme uh, side chain, it might happen before, after, or during the attack. 
uh, that would generate a tetrahedral intermediate, and then in the subsequent step, that intermediate would collapse to kick off adenosine monophosphate, or AMP, as the leaving group, and now you have your fatty acid thioester, where the group on the end is acetyl-CoA. That's going to be important because in the next few steps, our goals are going to be to break this bond between alpha and beta carbons to clip off one unit of acetyl-CoA. Sorry. And the process of clipping off one unit of acetyl-CoA from the thioester is called beta oxidation. And uh, that will become, why it's called beta oxidation will become clearer as we go through. Uh, as I said, the goal is to clip off units of acetyl-CoA. And once we've taken off one, we want to be at a structure uh, what's left behind needs to still be a thioester so it can come back here to this step one and go through another cycle. I'll try to make that clearer in a little bit. So here is an example of uh, the fatty acid. I've shown the long hydrocarbon chain, but not all of it. And I've identified in purple the alpha and the beta carbons relative to the carbonyl carbon of the uh, thioester. And then uh, this step is going to be an oxidation. We're actually going to oxidize the thioester into an alpha-beta unsaturated thioester, uh, going from the alkane to the alkene. And that's uh, a process that's called, uh, that's going to be catalyzed by a dehydrogenase because basically you're removing an equivalent of H2 from the fatty acid thioester. The oxidizing agent is FAD, uh, and the enzyme is acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Uh, the mechanism of this reaction is probably E1CB, probably like we saw from going from succinate to fumarate. So some base will remove uh, oops, sorry, a proton from the alpha carbon uh, to generate an enolate. You could show uh, the arrows slightly different than I have done. You could have just had the arrows stay on the alpha carbon instead of drawing this resonance structure of the enolate. I'm going to generate the enolate and then the enolate, the, the, ox, the electrons on the oxygen will kick down. We'll swing these uh, the electrons from the pi bond between carbonyl carbon and alpha carbon over to make a new pi bond between alpha and beta carbons. If we stopped there, we would have too many bonds to carbon, so we've got to get rid of H minus. H has to leave with its electrons, and it will do so being, de oops, sorry, being delivered and handed off directly to this nitrogen in, um, sorry, I'm really struggling with that arrow. This nitrogen in FAD uh, will rearrange the electrons in FAD and then we'll pick up a proton from some source. And the products will be our alpha beta unsaturated thioester and FADH2. Again, the mechanism is first make the enolate, and then we'll do the elimination step where a hydride uh, is delivered 
to FAD to give you FADH2. Okay, that's one oxidation step, and it involved both the alpha and the beta carbons. The second step is going to be conjugate addition of water to the alpha beta unsaturated thioester. And remember, our goal is ultimately going to be to break the bond between the alpha and the beta carbons. Um, some of you may look at that alpha beta unsaturated thioester and say, hey, that looks like something we could have got from an aldol reaction. And indeed, the next step we're going to do is uh, something that will also will, will convert this alpha beta unsaturated thioester into something else that is also a potential aldol product. We're going to add water to the beta carbon of the alpha beta unsaturated thioester. The enzyme that does this is called enoyl CoA hydratase. Uh, some base will deprotonate water, making it a good enough nucleophile to attack. And then water, uh, the hydroxide will attack the beta carbon of the alpha beta unsaturated thioester. Uh, this will, uh, the electrons from the pi bond will move over onto the alpha carbon or onto the carbonyl oxygen to give you an enolate. And that enolate would look like this. With now a hydroxyl group on the beta carbon. And then in a subsequent step, the enolate will electrons on the oxygen will kick down and the enolate will be deep, will be protonated on the alpha carbon by some base or rather by some acid perhaps the conjugate acid of our base and this will give us a beta hydroxy thioester now let's just think hypothetically for a minute if you look at this beta hydroxy thioester you might say that this is a potential aldol product, meaning we could split the molecule at the bond between C alpha and C beta via a retro aldol. Okay, let's imagine if we were to do that. What would the products be? Well, uh, if we were to do that retroaldol, presumably the acetyl-CoA portion would be the nucleophile, the enolate, which would uh, we could then protonate on the alpha carbon to give you acetyl-CoA. Um, all right, that would clip off a molecule of acetyl-CoA, so that's check for goal number one. But what would be left on the other side? If the enolate, um, if we do the retroaldol reaction, the beta carbon would become, think about it, see if you can get it, pause the video, or if you don't want to pause, I'll do elevator music again. That a little attempt at the bossa nova um, actually worked great when my son Dallin was little. Uh, I would do that and he would fall right asleep. Well, I would I would pat him and bounce while also doing the bossa nova and uh, he would fall asleep. He hasn't shown any inclination for Latin beats since then, maybe because they're associated with nap time. Anyway, those of you that have figured this out, if we did the retroaldol reaction, the beta carbon would convert from the beta hydroxy group to an aldehyde. Now, does that match up with goal number two? Remember, our goals were first to clip off units of acetyl-CoA, check, 
but make the process iterative. If we do the retro aldol at that stage, we get uh, we would get an aldehyde, not a thioester. So actually, we don't want to do So this approach, doing the retroaldol at this stage, would not accomplish our goal. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, and I spelled goal, I think, in the appropriate way if we were Spanish speaking. Uh, this would not accomplish our goal of making the process iterative. So uh, we will... So we have ruled out the retro aldol as a potential step here. It turns out that the next step of uh, fatty acid beta oxidation is to take the beta hydroxy thioester and convert it by oxidation into uh, with NADH into a beta keto thioester. Uh, this is done by the typical hydride delivery mechanism that you've seen before for alcohols to ketones using NAD plus as the oxidizing agent. Go back to metabolism lecture number two, part two, uh, to see an example of that mechanism. Um, that converts our fatty acid... Beta hydroxy thioester to a beta keto thioester, which is a Claisen product. Um, remember, the Claisen reaction is a reaction between two esters, so this could be a Claisen product for a uh, thioester for a version of the Claisen. If we did a retro Claisen reaction, we could have used. Uh, an enolate from acetyl-CoA and then presumably the beta carbon would had to have been um, at the ester oxidation state. Uh, so thinking forward not backwards in terms of the Claisen reaction you could have an enolate attack the carbonyl carbon to get a tetrahedral intermediate which would collapse and CoA would be kicked off and that would make the beta keto thioester Similarly, we could go backwards here. And so now we've set up all the functional groups so that we can clip the molecule at the bond between alpha and beta carbons and get off a unit of acetyl-CoA. But then what would be left behind will be at the oxidation state of a thioester, and we should be ready to go. Okay. <clears throat> So the next step is going to be that retro Claisen reaction. Uh, you've got your beta keto thioester, and uh, it turns out that lone pairs from some base, it's actually a histidine in the protein, uh, it's the ring nitrogen with the lone pairs in histidine, uh, removes a proton from uh, a cysteine residue making it nucleophilic enough to attack the beta keto. Oh, Joshua, got the wrong thioester. Make it nucleophilic enough to attack the beta keto group, uh, the carbonyl carbon of the beta ketone. All right. Histidine deprotonates cysteine, making it nucleophilic enough to attack the ketone at the carbonyl carbon to give us a tetrahedral intermediate. That tetrahedral intermediate looks like this. Um, and it's at this stage Uh, it's at this stage that we're going to kick off 
the acetyl-CoA enolate from the tetrahedral intermediate. So electrons on the oxygen are going to kick down. Uh, we're going to break the bond between alpha and beta carbons. We could show the arrow going to the alpha carbon, but it turns out that the acetyl-CoA enolate is actually going to rip a proton off another cysteine residue. This is cysteine 403 in the enzyme instead of cysteine 125. Um, if it's okay, since we're running out of space, I'm going to copy this intermediate and bring it down here. Okay. After that step, we have uh, acetyl-CoA free, and this is ready to go to the citric acid cycle. <clears throat> and uh, still left inside the enzyme, we have an acyl enzyme intermediate. where the uh, fatty acid that's now two carbons shorter uh, is linked to cysteine 125. Uh, and then negatively charged cysteine 403 will actually remove the proton from coenzyme A making it nucleophilic enough to deprotonate, uh, well, it'll deprotonate coenzyme A, making it nucleophilic enough to attack the thioester. We will get another tetrahedral intermediate which will collapse kicking off the cysteine residue which is actually going to pick up the proton back from uh, histidine 375 which is in its imidazolium state and that gives you the desired product. You don't need to memorize these enzyme residues. Um, that's just for your information and of course on a open book exam, uh, open book open notes exam, uh, it, it's uh, memorization is not going to help you very much. But I do want you to understand chemically what's going on here, how we're using the retroclasin strategy. We put all the functional groups in place we're using it to clip off a unit of acetyl-CoA, which we shunt off to the citric acid cycle. And then we have what's left behind is our new thioester that's two carbons shorter. And this is now an appropriate thioester to go back to step one of fatty acid beta oxidation, where we're going to first put a double bond in then um, put an OH group in via conjugate addition, then oxidize that OH group to a ketone, then you've got a new beta keto ester and you can break that bond between new beta alpha and beta carbons via a Claisen reaction. So um, in this way, by iterating through this process, we clip off successive uh, two carbon units as acetyl-CoA. Uh, and those can go to the citric acid cycle. Now, uh, get a, to get a sense for how uh, energy rich these fatty acids are, let's go back up to the top where we talked about uh, 16 and 18 carbon units. How many acetyl CoA's are stored in an 18 carbon fatty acid? Uh, well, that would be nine acetyl CoA equivalents. How many acetyl-CoA's did we get from glucose? We got two acetyl-CoA's from glucose. So um, 
we could store in this fatty acid um, let's see nine acetyl coas divided by two basically four and a half equivalents of glucose could have been stored in this uh, fatty acid and then as we liberate individual acetyl CoA units they can go to the citric acid cycle and crank through to generate uh, GTP, FADH2, and three NADHs which can then go to the electron transport chain and generate uh, more ATP. So it's an efficient way of storing energy. All right so that was a bit of a whirlwind and if you need a break go ahead and take one. Uh, I want to spend the rest of today, not too long hopefully, talking about the synthesis of cholesterol. And this will be a review of some things you learned, uh, maybe if you took 351 from me, and if not, this may be new to you again. Uh, not memorization, but understanding chemical strategy is what is key here. So our first goal in cholesterol biosynthesis is to make these two five carbon uh, subunits, one called isopentenyl pyrophosphate. Uh, these are each five carbons. I number them this way. One, oops, you don't have to. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, with a double bond between carbons one and two. This is where you get the isopentene group. And then pyrophosphate refers to this group on the end of the molecule, a good leaving group. And it's isomer dimethylallyl pyrophosphate, also one, two, three, four, five carbons, uh, with a double bond between carbons two and four. By the way, if you don't want to draw out the pyrophosphate group, it is perfectly acceptable uh, to draw the molecule like this, only I make sure I write the charge down so that I don't forget. Uh, what the abbreviation for pyrophosphate means. That's just great. You can do that with isopentenyl pyrophosphate. So uh, how do we get a five carbon unit? We're going to start with acetyl-CoA, but remember that acetyl-CoA has an even number of carbons. So we can make a four carbon uh, precursor and a six carbon precursor. We can't make a five carbon precursor. And uh, we, unless we lose a carbon along the way. What reaction have we done before where we've been able to lose a carbon? Well, decarboxylation of a six carbon precursor would get us to that stage. So we're gonna need to make a six carbon precursor with the functional groups in the right place uh, such that we could do decarboxylation to get one of these products. So we're going to start out with acetyl-CoA. We're going to react it with another molecule of acetyl-CoA via a Claisen reaction. So in this reaction we would take a base, uh, the base would remove a proton to make the uh, from the alpha carbon of acetyl-CoA to make an enolate. That enolate would then attack the carbonyl carbon of the other thioester to give a tetrahedral intermediate, which would, uh, which I can draw here. Sorry, that suddenly got messy. Here's the tetrahedral intermediate, which electrons on that oxygen would kick down and kick off. CoA as a leaving group and it would pick up a proton from somewhere. I suppose if you want to show that you can. Giving us acetoacetyl-CoA and coenzyme A as our products. Notice that acetoacetyl-CoA is a beta keto ester. It's the product of a Claisen reaction. Uh, it should look familiar because you encountered a molecule like this in the acetoacetate um, malonic ester synthesis. All right. 
Uh, so now we've got a four carbon unit, but we don't have, uh, we need to add an additional acetyl-CoA. Now, in, uh, so what we're going to do next, and this is an important part of generating this branching methyl group carbon three, uh, to get that structure, we're going to uh, use another equivalent of acetyl-CoA. Uh, we're going to use the enolate of that acetyl-CoA, but instead of attacking the thioester, we're going to do an aldol reaction. So in the aldol reaction, we have a base, remove a proton to generate the enolate, and then the enolate attacks the carbonyl carbon of the ketone to give you a tetrahedral intermediate, and no leaving group leaves. It turns out in this case that that uh, tetrahedral intermediate, that oxygen, is simply protonated by some acid. And this creates our six carbon <clears throat> precursor. Uh, we get the orange portions from acetoacetyl-CoA that we got from the Claisen reaction. And then this is the bond in pink that we just made uh, between the enolate of acetyl-CoA and um, the carbonyl carbon of, uh, the, of the ketone in our orange precursor. Uh, notice that this product is a beta hydroxycarbonyl compound um, and that this product is, is symmetrical. Now it turns out that for our purposes uh, we don't need both acetyl-CoA's. In fact, if we want to do a decarboxylation, one of those is going to have to turn into a carboxylic acid. So we're going to use water to do thioester hydrolysis. You've seen ester hydrolysis before. I won't show you the mechanism. Basically, a base would deprotonate water, which would attack the carbonyl carbon of the purple one uh, to give you a tetrahedral intermediate, which would collapse and kick off coenzyme A as a leaving group. The product of this reaction is hydroxymethylglutaryl CoA. Um, glutaryl is a five carbon, one, two, three, four, five carbon acid. Uh, glutaryl CoA says one of those acids is uh, five carbon diacid. One of those acids is tied up as a thioester with coenzyme A. And then the hydroxymethyl refers to the fact that you've got the OH and the methyl group in the middle of the molecule. Again, thinking of where we need to end up with something like uh, isopentenyl pyrophosphate, we need um, this probably CO2 group to go away. Um, and we need a double bond here. So that means this OH is going to have to go away. And then we need this thioester to be at the alcohol oxidation state and then to get modified with pyrophosphate. So this molecule is called hydroxymethylglutaryl-CoA, or HMG-CoA. Um, and the next step is to reduce HMG-CoA using an enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. And this enzyme will take two molecules of NADPH that's very similar to NADH, only it has an extra phosphoryl group. Uh, and we will use two molecules of NADPH to deliver two hydrides to uh, the carbonyl carbon of the thioester. First one to get a tetrahedral intermediate to kick off coenzyme A, that would then be an aldehyde, and then we deliver another hydride to the aldehyde to give you this alcohol. 
In so doing, we, we reduce HMG-CoA to mevalinate. Um, uh, and let me just get you started on what that mechanism would look like by drawing for you just this portion of the Na. Uh, shoot. Just draw you this portion of the uh, NADH molecule. Sorry, folks, I need to move our label for HMG-CoA. Do you need to memorize names? No, but you'll account encounter these again in the future, and uh, it'll be useful if they're familiar to you. Uh, NADPH is going to uh, re-aromatize. Oops. Sorry, people. Uh, electrons from the nitrogen will kick down to form a pi bond there and a pi bond there, and hydride will be delivered to the thioester to give a tetrahedral intermediate, which will kick down and collapse and kick off coenzyme A. Then we'll do the same kind of thing to the resulting aldehyde to get this product mevalinate, where we've done one of the things we needed to do. We've gotten from the thioester oxidation state down to the alcohol. Um, the enzyme that does this, as I believe I said, is HMG-CoA reductase, and this is the enzyme that's inhibited by statin drugs. So just as in a little aside, not anything you need to memorize, but something that's Im uh, important to United States health, uh, this molecule Lipitor is one of these statin drugs. Here is its structure. Uh, if you squint, you can sort of think of how it maybe resembles the structure of HMG-CoA, at least in the presence of an alcohol that's beta to a carboxylic acid, kind of like you've got here. Um, this fits into the active site of HMG-CoA reductase. Uh, perhaps this portion of the molecule mimics the uh, ring of NADPH. I don't know. Uh, that is known, though. There would be studies in the literature, and you can go look it up and see. Uh, this drug is called Lipitor. Generic name is atorvastatin. It was developed by Pfizer, patented, discovered in 1986. Clinical trials and everything took until 1996 to be approved. And at that point, uh, there were only a few years left on uh, before patent expiration. Uh, so they were able to market the drug and sell it for an additional 14 years, exclusive rights for marketing. The patent expired in 2011 and generated a total of $125 billion in sales for Pfizer. Um, it was estimated during the heyday that about a quarter of Pfizer's annual revenue came from Lipitor sales. Um, then in 2011, uh, the patent expired and, and Pfizer went off the patent cliff. Uh, generic uh, sales, uh, sales of generic versions of atorvastatin uh, now account for a majority of the sales of this molecule each year. But as of 2017, there were 104 million prescriptions for atorvastatin in the United States, meaning one out of three Americans is taking this drug. I am one of those 104 million people and this molecule really regulates my cholesterol. So uh, anyway, this is an important step and those of you that are gonna be physicians that might prescribe Lipitor, now you know what it does, you know what step it inhibits and I want you to always remember that you saw uh, that step here in your OCHEM class. Um, next, we're gonna install the pyrophosphate group via two phosphorylation reactions. Mevalinate kinase is the enzyme that's going to take ATP and convert it to ADP as this OH group on mevalinate attacks the gamma phosphoryl group of an ATP molecule to generate mevalinate 5 phosphate. This is making a phosphoester. The mechanism here is going to be similar to the first step of glycolysis, uh, or what I showed you for that step in the metabolism part two lecture. Next is another phosphorylation event where one of the oxygens on the phosphate group of mevalinate 5-phosphate 
attacks the gamma phosphoryl group of ATP again in an SN2 reaction similar to what you've seen before. That installs the next phosphate group, so now we've installed the pyrophosphate. What's left? Well, we need to decarboxylate and we need to get rid of the alcohol. Now, you've seen decarboxylation before in the context of alpha uh, of beta keto acids, but we can't oxidize this OH to a beta keto group because it's a tertiary alcohol. So instead, we're going to have to turn the OH into a good leaving group and then uh, do the decarboxylation. We're going to uh, turn the OH into a good leaving group via by phosphorylating this OH group uh, using ATP. And again, it's going to be uh, an SN2-like reaction to take uh, mevalinate pyrophosphate and phosphorylate the OH group. I'm abbreviating the phosphate group as OPO3 2 minus, and I'm abbreviating the pyrophosphate group as OPP3 minus. Uh, and that is uh, SN2 attack of this alcohol on the gamma phosphoryl group of ATP. At this stage, um, the repulsion of electrons of negative charges between the pyrophosphate group and the phosphate group promote the leaving group leaves uh, sort of first step of SN1-like reaction uh, to give us the following intermediate where we now have a positive charge on the beta carbon. We were able to do decarboxylation of beta keto esters because when uh, electrons from the oxygen kicked down and broke the bond between carbonyl carbon and alpha carbon, the electrons uh, would go onto the alpha carbon and be stabilized by resonance. Uh, this beta cation actually sets us up for a similar situation. These electrons kick down to form CO2. We break the bond between carbonyl carbon and alpha carbon. I'm going to, if it's okay, move this positive charge. Uh, sorry, folks. I want the beta here. I want the positive charge here, and I want the alpha there. Okay, so as CO2 is leaving, well, as CO2 kicks off the electrons between carbon and alpha carbon, carbonyl carbon and alpha carbon, these electrons move over and form a, a new pi bond between alpha and beta carbons. So if you think about it, this reaction is E1-like. You've got uh, a leaving group leaves, you've got a carbocationic intermediate, and you've got an elimination step, only uh, it's decarboxylation that instead of deprotonation uh, in, in, and if you're having a hard time seeing what I'm seeing, compare what I showed you up above with decarboxylation to this alternative where a base would remove the proton and electrons would kick down to form a pi bond. We're doing something very similar, but via decarboxylation instead of deprotonation. All right. Uh, at that stage, we've generated isopentenyl pyrophosphate, and um, we're going to use isopentenyl pyrophosphate isomerase to convert between IPP and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate, and essentially this is just tautomerization. All right, we've done enough for today. So we'll go ahead and pause. We'll pick up with this step next time and we'll connect what we're doing here all the way to 
uh, a precursor to esterol uh, using chemistry that you learned in, in 351. And then next time we'll do just a little bit on polymers. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay organic! <laughs>